Let's start by giving everybody a quick rundown on just what is the differences between inner canopy lighting and sub canopy lighting and why they matter in cannabis cultivation. Well, uh, the differences are in the name. Um, inter canopy goes in the canopy. And you might also hear this described as intra. The technical definition of inter or intra canopy, they're slightly different, but as a grower, don't worry about it. All you're doing is you're taking some light and you're sticking it um, in the canopy amongst the branches, amongst the leaves, amongst the bud. And sub canopy or under canopy lighting, again, those two things mean basically the same thing. You're taking a light source and you're putting it down below the canopy, whether that be lights right on your bench, whether it be on top of your pots, however you deploy it, it's just light that's below where the canopy begins and it's shining up onto the bottom of that canopy. That's it. All right. So one of the things that you and I have talked about is there's a lot of market confusion today about ICL or inner canopy lighting. What, what are those misconceptions that growers are having that you're talking to them about on a regular basis? Yeah, for sure. So the misconception is that whether you use intercanopy or subcanopy lighting, which by the way, going forward, I'm just going to talk about it as like dispersed lighting because you're re-dispersing light from the top of the canopy down lower or somewhere. There's a misconception that that's always going to increase the yield by some sensational number, right? There's a lot of uh, claims out there that feed these misconceptions that say, use intercanopy lighting, you're going to increase the yield by 20% or something like that, which that's a huge number, right? And if there is some sort of silver bullet that you can deploy in a crop and increase yield and therefore profits by 20%, you're going to do it. Um, <clears throat> the reality is that uh, nothing in life is ever that easy. Um, generally, when companies are making claims like that, usually it's founded on some sort of data, but usually that data is from a study where all they did was they took a crop where they had you know standard cultivation practices and they had standard top lighting already, and then they just added intercanopy light or they just added subcanopy light uh, as opposed to redistributing the light, right? So to be clear, uh, using an example, let's say you have a crop where you're already using a thousand micromoles of photons per meter square per second on top. If you add another 200 micromoles, then whether you add that as top light, whether you add it as intercanopy light, whether you add it as some canopy light, that 200 micromoles is going to do basically the same thing. It's going to increase your yield by about 20% because you've added more, you've added about 20% more light energy in this example. Uh, so that can be confusing to growers because if a company says, use our intercanopy light, it's going to increase yield by 20%. It's like, well, that's technically true, but they could also say, use 20% more light from us and it's going to increase your yield 20%. And cannabis is such a light hungry crop that that's going to be true uh, for most growers out there up until a, a really high kind of photosynthetic saturation limit that most growers aren't anywhere near right now. So basically you can just say, if you add more light, you're going to add more yield regardless of how you do it. Yeah. And that's true that we often hear that a lot of the growers are not at those high levels that you, you have uh, yeah. researched and seen out there to, that uh, can that cannabis can take. Now, how does the plant morphology and the canopy architecture overall come into play on this as well too? How does that affect it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, this really drives the decision of whether you'd want to consider an intercanopy or a subcanopy solution, because at the end of the day, it's really just about getting photons on the plant as efficiently as possible and minimizing kind of waste light that just goes, you know, onto the walls and the floor and into the sky, right? We don't want that. So if you're a grower and um, you have pretty widely spaced plants, well, in a case like that, whether you use intercanopy light or whether you use subcanopy, chances are a lot of that light is going to just go into the room and out your windows in a greenhouse, for example. And in a situation like that, you may not realize any benefit from a more dispersed lighting strategy. You may just use top light. But if you're in an indoor grow and you have like a really dense canopy, um, you know, I, I don't know if this is in frame or not, but like all the branches are kind of interwoven with each other. If you were to use an intercanopy light, it may be that that light is so surrounded by branches and buds that it's not penetrating very well through the canopy potentially not being utilized as well as if you have a sub canopy light, pardon me, a sub canopy light that's hitting an entire lower leaf surface, 
of just you know photosynthetic tissue that's going to drive photosynthesis and then shunt those photoassimilates to sink tissues, i.e. the buds. So <clears throat> I guess to be a little bit more concise, if you have a very, very dense canopy, chances are that a subcanopy or under canopy lighting solution is going to be a little bit better than an intercanopy. Whereas if you have a more dispersed canopy, uh, then an intercanopy light placed up amongst those bud sites could be a little bit better than a subcanopy. So do you think um, in typical North American conditions that we see here uh, with the growers that we talk to on a daily basis, should they be leaning more towards uh, subcanopy or uh, Based on your research findings, have you seen that, that there's a slightly better uh, outperformance on the SCL versus the uh, inner canopy? Based on the way that most people are growing in North America, you know, usually they're on like four foot wide tables. They have three or four rows of plants. Uh, more commonly, it's like three rows of plants on that table. That usually leads to a canopy density that we see as being a little bit more complementary to a sub canopy light. Uh, in fact, that's the way we've done our research, uh, explicitly comparing the effects of inner canopy versus sub canopy. And in our research across three cultivars, we've seen that on average, we were getting about 7.1% greater yield with subcanopy light when deploying the same total amount of energy uh, as a treatment where we had intercanopy light. So uh, again, to be concise, I would say for most growers in North America today, probably subcanopy is going to be a better option. Dave, having known you for a while, you also get into the practical applications of these things as well, too you and your team? I mean, what are some of the challenges that growers are now facing when they, they come to us and they, they, they ask these questions and they're intrigued, but then practically executing it? What, what, what do you see out there today? What are some of those challenges? So when you're trying to grow with intercanopy lighting or subcanopy lighting, you're going to run into just some logistical, practical challenges that you don't have when you're growing with just a top light. When you're growing with an intercanopy light, you have to deal with the fact that you do have a long fixed asset a piece of hardware amongst your leaves and amongst your branches and amongst your buds. If you're the grower that needs to move your plants around a lot for whatever reason, you may find that to be pretty cumbersome. You may also find it a little bit harder to mount the lights. It really depends on your situation. It depends on how you're trellising. <clears throat> it depends on what structure you have above the canopy. There are a lot of factors that may lead you to have more or less success trying to mount an intercanopy light versus a subcanopy light. Now, conversely, you may be the grower who's doing ebb and flood, or there's something about your pots um, that make the top of them unstable, or a hundred other things. There may be a lot of reasons why a subcanopy light poses more logistical challenges for you than an intercanopy might pose. So there's no single answer to say subcanopy or undercanopy is always better or always easier from a practical standpoint. And there's no generalization I can make to say that intercanopy is always better. In general, I personally, for the way that I like to grow, I find subcanopy a little bit easier, but it's still not without its challenges. I still have to be very mindful of cleaning them and making sure that my cabling is all nicely organized. Uh, it's really one of those things where as a grower, you need to think about your daily practices and what's going to make sense for you. You've also spoken a lot about photo bleaching. Over the years, we've talked about this and bringing in too much red light can really cause certain um, photo bleaching in certain cultivars. What are your recommendations for the actual light spectra when you get into ICL and SCL? What, what, what are the recommendations you're, you're putting out there right now today for these guys? Yeah. So when it comes to the spectrum you use for intercanopy lighting, what we've seen is that your spectral considerations are very, very similar to what you would use for top lighting. In other words, you want something that is white-ish in appearance. And by white-ish, I mean not too red. Um, we found that around 600 micromoles of photons per meter square per second is the absolute dose of red that cannabis buds can tolerate before they exhibit bleaching. And there's a lot of hand-waving around that number, right? Because it's like some cultivars like San Fernando Valley are very tolerant to red light and can take a lot before bleaching. Some cultivars like white rhino or blank check um, they'll photo bleach if you look at them wrong on a Tuesday, you know what I mean? So it's one of those things where if I say the absolute number is around 600 micromoles, you have to take that with a grain of salt and understand that <clears throat> you have to understand that you're going to have some cultivar to cultivar variability, uh, which leads me to my recommendation that if you're using an intercanopy light, something like Fluence's 
uh, BW4 spectrum, uh, otherwise known as Physio Spec Indoor, historically, um, it's a good bet. That's what I would go with for Intercampy Light. Now, from an ROI perspective, talking about the economics and the dollars behind this, when when are you guiding growers to consider ICL or subcanopy light? When when does that come into play from an economic standpoint? What what are you seeing out there? I think the biggest driver in that decision is what market you're selling into, because the biggest benefit that we see to intercanopy or subcanopy light is that it creates a more uniform canopy, uh, and more specifically, it's a more uniform bud yield. So the buds will be more uniform in mass and in volume, right? So you'll get less C grade or LARF or trim, whatever you'd like to call it. The lowest value product from your crop, you get less of that. You get more B grade and you get more A grade, right? The same total yield, the same total mass of bud off that plant may be basically the same, assuming that you're using the same total light energy. But again, the quality and grade of the bud that you're getting is going to be elevated on average. So if you're in a market where you can fetch a significantly higher dollar value for A or B grade bud, then you have a very different economic model than someone who is in a market where those things are valued roughly the same or the difference isn't all that pronounced. So again, it's a case by case basis. Every grower needs to do that economic analysis on their own or, or with us. We're always happy to help people go through that analysis because our goal is not to just, you know, shoehorn this solution into every grower and every facility. That's never, ever the goal of fluence. The goal is to find the right letting solution for the application. So if you think that intercanopy or subcanopy letting may be something that could add value to your crop, uh, get in touch with us so that we can go through that ROI calculation with you and determine if indeed that's the way you should go. Your team is not having just lighting conversations. This is an environment conversation that you guys are having. Like, like what's the impact of HVAC and some of the other uh, uh, variables yeah, that come into right. play as well too, right? For, with ICL. And... Yeah, exactly. I mean, my team is comprised of uh, environmental scientists like myself. Um, that's my background. Uh, we have horticultural scientists. We have past and present cannabis cultivators and our philosophy in, in the cannabis science team, but also across fluence is that yes, we sell lights, but lights themselves are not the sort of thing where you just implement a lighting strategy and assume everything else works, right? Like plants are a system where all of the inputs have to be in balance for that plant to be as successful as, as it possibly can be. Um, if you, Increased lighting, for instance, whether you do it with top light, whether you do it with intercanopy or subcanopy, it doesn't matter. If you increase the light energy on that crop, you're going to increase transpiration, right? Which is the movement of water up through the roots, through the stems and out the leaves. That means you're pushing more moisture into the air. And if you don't have sufficient HVAC capacity, uh, specifically dehumidification capacity, uh, to deal with the fact that you have more moisture going into the air, you're going to have a problem, right? You're going to have your stomates shut down. You're going to have more moisture just hanging out in the plants. You're going to have more pathogenic pressure. Um, these are all bad things, <laughs> suffice to say. And it's all, it's all manageable, right? You can deal with it. You should be monitoring your relative humidity and your vapor pressure deficit, and you should be adjusting the environment accordingly. And you can do that with increased dehumidification. You can mitigate it to some degree with how you manage your temperature, but it is a whole system. And it might sound like a lot to think about, but it's not as complicated as it sounds. I feel like I'm preaching to the choir because I'm sure most growers probably know this. But again, this is the sort of thing where if you're interested in adding more light and you're not sure about how else you need to manage your environment, get in touch with us. We are here to help and uh, we do this sort of thing every day to, uh, to make sure that our research facilities are running as they should be and to make sure that your grows are as profitable and as successful as they can be. As you look forward over the next couple of years, uh, around intercanopy lighting, subcanopy lighting, where do you see this industry evolving? What's it becoming? What it, what do you see happening? You look at your crystal ball. Yeah, well, I think in the immediate future, we want to have a more refined understanding of exactly when intercanopy uh, versus subcanopy is better or worse, right? Because right now, I'm able to describe some generalizations where it's like generally, if you have a very dense leafy canopy, subcanopy is the way to go. If it's a bit more of an airy canopy. Uh, intercanopy is the way to go. If it's a very spread out canopy, just top lighting is the way to go, right? I would like to be able to put more specific metrics around that. So I can say to a grower, if this is your situation, 
then objectively, this is the better lighting solution. I also think that uh, a little bit further out, we're going to have a more refined understanding of exactly what spectra are optimal for subcanopy lighting. At the moment, I think there are things that you can do with subcanopy spectrum that you can't do with intercanopy spectrum and you can't do with your top light spectrum. And if this proves to be true, it's going to change the economics for our cannabis growers worldwide. Uh, that's very exciting. And uh, I hope I hope that ends up being true. Um, beyond that, there are going to be other cultivation factors that are going to change the way growers grow overall. Uh, in particular, in Western Europe right now, there is a lot of attention being put upon no veg style of cultivation. And once again, that changes your canopy architecture. It changes how you do your planting density. It changes where your bud sites are. Uh, it changes the overall height of the crop. And all of these things contribute to the decision making process of whether to use intercanopy or subcanopy or top lighting alone. Uh, I think in the next two to three years, we're going to see a pretty big change in the way growers grow. Uh, that's going to be maybe not how they do it today, but it is going to be more profitable. Dr. Holly, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a fantastic insight into intercanopy and under canopy lighting. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me.